Well, I lost my love and I lost my loot in Las Vegas, Nevada. My gal ran out when all of my dough was gone. The Fallout series is filled with memorable characters and moments. With a lifespan at the time of this recording of over two decades, it only makes sense that the events and the people involved with them would stick out in our minds. The Wasteland is home to many walks of life, but few have first-hand knowledge of what life was like before the Great War. And if you want to continue to know what life is like before the Great War, you should consider subscribing to the channel for more Fallout content. I would hate to have to launch the nukes over this. One such figure is Robert Edwin House, de facto leader of New Vegas and formidable czar of the Securitrons. While most people who have taken the role of the courier may have extensive experience with Mr. House, few may know his whole story. And in celebration of the actual day of his birth, that is precisely what we're going to be looking at in this video today. House was born June 25, 2020, into a wealthy family, though his life would be flipped upside down when both of his parents were killed in a horrific accident involving an auto gyro and a lightning strike. After this shocking event, tensions would arise between Robert and his half-brother Anthony. Anthony would ultimately let greed take control and take all of the inheritance for himself. Anthony House considered himself the only true legitimate son of the House dynasty. This led him to seize control of the H&H &H Tools Company that his father left behind. Anthony hated his half-brother Robert and showed this with these actions, even hiring cutthroat lawyers to annex everything he could from Robert. By all accounts, Anthony was a paranoid schizophrenic, though the company performed well under him. The new CEO would often wear a special hat and refuse to look anyone in the eye to avoid them stealing his thought energy. This type of behavior leaked into the security Anthony had installed around the building as well. Business deals were to be done in English only, bathrooms would be sealed, and random DNA screenings would litter the workspace. Anthony only seemed to trust his right hand, Cindy Lou Kreb, who would enforce his outlandish policies. Defeated, but not surprised, Robert House would focus on his education, attending the Commonwealth Institute of Technology. Returning home to Las Vegas, Robert would found Robco Industries on his 22nd birthday, June 25th, 2042. Robco would become one of the largest and most influential computer and robotics corporations in the pre-war United States, developing the unified operating system that most terminals would go on to use as well as an array of robots that ordinary citizens could afford. Thanks to some hefty defense contracts, Robco would also construct military-grade robots for the U.S. Armed Forces. Some debate has been made about the name of the company, with some attributing to a combination of Robotics Corporation and some assuming that it is named after the founder himself, Robert House. Both could be true. Though rivaled by General Atomic International's line of robots, the majority encountered in the wasteland come from Robco. Due to the mass production of these robots before the war, America's working class would be displaced, and the automation riots would ensue following the massive loss of jobs to automation. Robco would still hold fast, being unmatched in specific fields, such as Robert Mayflower's Stealth Boy, which Robco reverse-engineered from captured Chinese technology. These types of operations only added weight and bravado to Robco, making them somewhat untouchable due to expertise. House would show that he would get what he wanted by any means necessary, and Robco would develop a reputation for hostile takeovers. Assets like Repcon Aerospace were overtaken by buying shares and turning the upper brass against each other until they had nothing better to do than merge or sell to Robco, with other companies simply being destroyed. This bothered Anthony. As Robco began to buy more and more h, &H tool stock, he became increasingly paranoid of a hostile takeover. Convinced that his employees were working against him and helping his brother take h, h tools, this would lead Anthony to eventually losing faith in everyone, including Cindy Lou Kreb, and locking down the facility, afraid that his brother was coming to physically remove him from his office. He wouldn't go down without a fight. In reality, Robco would kill h, &H in the market with aggressive trading practices. Though Robco had built a reputation on aggressive tactics and takeovers, it doesn't mean that they never forged partnerships or joint ventures, the most important of which was with vault Tech Industries. Robco would go on to design the Pip-Boy, a personal information processor that was designed to hold all statistics of the owner. Of course, there was no amount of words to describe how important this tech would become, and it was crucial to vault Tech's mission. Robco would dip its toes in many ventures, teaming with the Nuka-Cola Corporation and opening the Robco Battle Zone as a part of the grand opening of the Galactic Zone in the Nuka World theme park. Or, one of their more significant moves was with the Hornwright Industrial and Atomic Mining Services, which planned on displacing many from their homes in the Cranberry Bog 
and building a fully automated city of the future at the site of Watoga National Park with the Robco facility nearby, providing them with jobs and advanced technologies. Robco would be given military contract 38917. In cooperation with General Atomics International, Robco was contracted to build the most potent combat robot in the history of warfare to liberate Anchorage, Alaska from Chinese occupation. This was an operation not only for military strength, but also for propaganda and the idea to strike fear in the hearts of the enemies of America. Liberty Prime, the 40-foot-tall superweapon, would spew anti-communist rhetoric and could throw nuclear bombs by hand. This new fame Mr. House had garnered did have its setbacks as well, as tabloids would pick up on stories that were pretty damning to his public image, such as a relationship that bloomed between House and a starlet. The tabloids would report that House was only dating her to scan her brain and make her wear different outfits. This is strictly a rumor. One building Robert House took an interest in is the Lucky 38 Casino, previously the site of some colorful activities, like a mob shootout that happened nearby, which saw Shanghai Sally use the Lucky 38 as a hideout before escaping through the window. House would adapt the casino to be fit for the apocalypse throughout his life, seemingly his new life work, setting it up with all types of defenses that he planned would keep not only the casino safe, but all of Las Vegas as well, once the coming atomic Armageddon took place. House was sure that the world would meet its end and came to this conclusion with the help of one of his newest hobbies, designing mathematical paradigms based on global political and socioeconomic conditions to predict future events. By 2065, Mr. House was positive that the world would be cast in nuclear fire within 15 years. His connections in the US military informed him that at least 77 warheads were pointed at Las Vegas. This info led House to launching satellites designed to disarm missiles coming his way and laser cannons on the roof of the Lucky 38 to stop any bombs he may have missed. As far as House himself, he would enter a rather sophisticated life support system that was deemed a hibernation chamber. This would take care of any physical needs his body would muster. House's brain was pretty much uploaded, for lack of a better term, to a vast information network he had created. At this time, House was pretty much a supercomputer that used the Securitrons as a type of body. To finally make it all come together, Robert House just needed one more thing, a device that acted as a combination access card and high capacity data storage device. This platinum chip held vital upgrades to House's operation system. 20 hours before it was to be delivered on October 23rd, 2077, Mr. House's event would go down. The Great War would decimate the planet and most people living on it. Due to the inferior OS and not getting his upgrades, House was only able to save Las Vegas from 68 out of the 77 warheads, 59 disarmed, and 9 destroyed. This would also cause mass power outages and ultimately force House to reboot his system to a previous OS, putting him in a decades-long coma. House wouldn't show himself again until 2274, when Securitrons began to file out of the Lucky 38. The NCR just started scouting Hoover Dam, and to avoid the strip being annexed by the group, House would rebuild the city and secure it with his robots. All of this was done with the help of the three families that ran the casinos on the strip. Once the NCR did show up in Vegas, House quickly signed the New Vegas Treaty and allowed the NCR use of McCarran Airport for a base of operations. All of this side business was just more obstacles in the way of Mr. House's real goal, obtaining the platinum chip. Over the years, House would spend over a million caps on teams sent out to look for the chip. This all paid off in 2281 when one of his scav teams ended up finding the chip. 204 years of searching, finally done. Contracting the Mojave Express, Mr. House would arrange to have the chip delivered. Knowing the importance of the item, House planned quite a bit ahead to cover most mishaps. Merc teams were sent out on the routes beforehand to make sure that they were clear of danger, as House wanted the courier to travel alone to not add suspicion to the package. House also hired multiple couriers, carrying novelty junk items like fuzzy dice. No one would be able to pin down exactly which courier had the chip. Despite this planning, it would be Mr. House's protege, Benny, that would ultimately try to ruin the master plan. Using Yes Man to spy on House, Benny was able to get the direct route of the courier carrying the chip. He would go on to hire the cons for help as to not raise any flags in Vegas. This group would intercept the courier in Good Springs, kill them, and take the chip. Benny would then be able to use the chip to make New Vegas independent of House and his robots and shape it into his own vision. House was a bit too smart for this and had already learned of Benny's betrayal. The New Vegas royalty would plant Victor, a Securitron, in Good Springs. Victor would dig the courier out of this makeshift grave and take them to the nearby clinic ran by Doc Mitchell. With Victor, House could follow and influence the courier as well as ensure the chip's delivery. The rest of the story? Well, that would be up to the courier. Mr. House needs that chip and will do almost anything to get it. No act of betrayal or threats from bulls or bears will scare him from his lifelong goal. 
securing Vegas as the shining beacon in the desert he knows it deserves to be. With the coming battle at Hoover Dam, House again faces a crossroads, where the fate of his entire legacy rests in the hands of another. The gambler rolls his dice again. Thank you for watching my video on Mr. House, and if you enjoyed it, think about leaving a like and subscribing for more content. I want to thank my patrons and YouTube channel members, and a special thanks to my biggest supporters. Kim Jong-un, Broadway, Stupendous Skellington, Hackerman, Irwin, Fireflare, Primark Mustard, Edgy, Bill Scott Sheets, Death6199, Laud Have Mercy, and Thomas. Thank you all so much for your continued support. I could not do this without you. Thanks again for watching. I will catch you on the next one. It has been mantis uh, i got to testify come up in the spot look at extra fly for the day you die you going to trust the sky you going to trust the sky baby girl testify come up in the spot look at extra fly.